Um, hello, and welcome back to the Paper Soprano podcast. My name is Heidi, and I am your host, and you're here, and I'm here, and we're ready to chat. So let's get into it, you guys. Um, Today was kind of a weird day. I actually started recording this episode, like... 20 minutes ago, but I got interrupted by a phone call, which, you know, totally chill. No rules here. So we just, we just delete the whole thing and we start over. There is no editing. And if you have ever been a guest on this podcast, you know that. And if you ever plan on being a guest in the future, you should know that because girl, we do not edit here. This is low key. (laughs) This is low effort, minimal, you know, things happening here. And that's just, that's just the vibe, okay? That's just the feel. That's the whole, that's the whole thing. The whole palette, okay? So we're starting over. And if you hear a little bit of like, uh, rustling, um, know that that is my rice bag. Today was a little bit warm. And so I turned down the heat in my apartment, but now it's like cold again. And I'm like, okay, cool. Got to turn it up, and now I'm cold, and, like, hello? <laughs> it's like when you wear too much clothes. Like, you wear too many layers, and then, like, throughout the afternoon, you have to take them off, but then you have to put them back on again. Like, why? Like, why is the Northeast like this? You know? And also, I knew, I found out today that, like, I guess California is having, like, record high temperatures for this time of year. I saw that it was, like, 90 degrees in parts of California today. Like, cool, we love global warming. Like, <laughs> Not funny, actually. Seriously, a big issue. But anyway, today's going to be a rather short podcast, mainly because there wasn't necessarily anything crazy for me to tell you about that happened today. But I want to talk to you about something that I hate for a second, which is, okay, when you get like a hardcover book, right? And you're, you're sitting there and it's looking cute. You're loving it. And you open it up and it has those like that stupid like paper or plastic sleeve on the outside of the book. But like the cover on the inside looks different and better than like the outside sleeve thing. Like why, why do we need to put the sleeve thing on? I feel so bad throwing it away and getting rid of it. Because I'm like, listen, I don't want to, like, throw anything away. This is, like, a nice book. And, like, what do I do with this now? Because I don't want this on here. And it gets all in the way when I'm trying to open the book and close the book. And, like, it's not attached to the spine. So it gets all, like, messed up. And I'm like, what is this? Like, am I the only one who feels upset about these sleeves? Like, I've got this one from the Beatles book that I just got that has, like... Um, it's like a, a story behind each one of their songs. And I was using the book last night. I was killing it. I was like listening to my record player, hanging out, jamming out, rocking out. It was great. And like, I ended up getting so frustrated with this stupid book cover thing. I just ripped it off and I feel really bad because I'm like, what do I do with this thing? I don't want to keep it. Like, <laughs> But I also don't want to throw it out. Ugh. Anyway. Um, yeah, so that's that. But last night I did have a really nice time listening to... I listened to Abbey Road with this book. And it's really an interesting thing. Like, they really just lay out each of the Beatles songs. And they give, like, a little backstory, I guess, to each of the songs. Or some kind of, like, anecdote or thing that might go along with it. And then they also present all of the lyrics to the piece and a couple other, like, tidbits of information and usually, like, a really cool, high-quality photo. Highly recommend. It's called The Complete Beatles Songs, The Stories Behind Every Song Written by the Fab Four by Steve Turner. And if if you're into the Beatles and you have an interest in maybe doing a complete listening or going album to album and just kind of sitting down and, you know, having like a guided listening session session with all of these 
little blurbs. They're really quick reads, so, like, you can get through it in one song and, and you know, you can, you can enrich your life if, you, if you're into that. But anyway, speaking of enriching our lives, <laughs> I have had a goal in mind for the past couple of weeks, and that goal has been just to opt or utilize all of the things that I have currently. And I know that's a large task because we all have like little things here and there that we don't use or books that we don't use or um, just things in our life that we're not really utilizing very much. And I think that that's really upsetting mainly because I don't know, I just I want things to be in my life intentionally. And that being said, I found this book today. I was reorganizing one of my bookshelves and I found this book today called Minute Sketches of Great Composers. And I'm going to start including this on every podcast. And like it says, they're just a minute long. This is actually by, who is this by? Um... Eva, Eva B. Hansel and Helen Kaufman. And it is 74 full page um, minute sketches of great composers. Great to me in all uh, parentheses there. Mainly because this is a relatively old book. I want to say it was written. Let's do a little research here. When was this written? Copyright 1932, you guys. Yeah, and it smells like it. It's got that old book smell. You know what I'm saying. Like mothballs and like, <laughs> you know, you know the smell, okay? You know what I'm talking about, that old book smell. Um, I used to work in a library, so that kind of smell is very reminiscent for me. And yeah, man, we're just going to read one of these sketches every day and... We're just going to enrich our lives. So let's start with the first one here. All right. We're not going to read the foreword because who reads the foreword? <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm not going to read you the foreword, though. Um, I do I do usually read the foreword in many books. I don't know about you or like the introduction, blah, 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 because I don't know. Maybe it's I have this like purist kind of dedication to authors where it's like I feel like I want to experience the book as they intended it. And some pe I know a lot of people who just like don't give a crap and they just like s read past it or they skip it completely. But I will read that on my own. And we're going to jump right in to the first one here, which is Giovanni per Luigi de Palestrina. Yes. Palestrina here, you guys. Born 1525 and died 1594. It reads, God's in his heaven, all's right with the world, is what young Giovanni Perluigi might have sung one bright spring day about 1538 as he passed by the church of Santa Maria Maggiore in Rome, whither he had repaired for a day's outing from his hometown in, of Palestrina. So clearly and joyously did he sing that the priest at his orisons, orisons in the church promptly invited him to become a choir boy there, an invitation he promptly accepted. Later, he became an organist of the little church of San Agapito in Palestrina, from which he took his name, until he was summoned to Rome. And all the rest of his curiously quiet and uneventful life was passing, was passed in writing music for the church and training choirs to sing it. He was wholly dependent for his livelihood upon the favor of the resigning of the reigning pope. Thus, his first book of masses was fulsomely dedicated to Pope Julius, a kindly patron, while the glorious mass of Marcellus tendered Julius Julius's successor was one of his finest. But Paul, his successor, was a sour soul who banished Palestrina from the choir because married choir masters were displeasing to Mother Church. So at the height of his powers, Palestrina was obliged to retire to poverty, illness, 
the wife he had married at 21, and their two children. In a few months, however, another church sought him out, and rightly, church music had been in a bad way. The songs of the streets had invaded its purity and vulgarized the church service, and an August committee, the Council of Trent, having been in session for 20 years, trying to de determine what would be done about it, now proclaimed that the masses of Palestrina, being the only ones which wholly embodied their ideal of pure music, should be used as models. No wonder his townspeople gave him a great demonstration when he was 50. They marched through the streets of Rome, Palestrina at their head, singing in chorus the music he had written. Dang, okay. That music was perfect of its kind. He took the cantus firmus, or the basic theme, and wrote two or three harmonizing voices of the utmost simplicity to be sung with it. This laid the foundation for later polyphonic or many-voiced writing. Without Palestrina, there might have been no Bach, no Beethoven. The little princeps musicae, gra uh, graven on his, to uh, his tomb in Rome, where he died February 2nd, 19 or 1594, marked him as the first prince of a royal lineage of church composers. Ooh, church music, yeah! <laughs> um, yeah, man, I think that Palestrina is some someone that we all, like, know, I feel. Like, music history, you're like, yeah, of course, yeah, Palestrina. But it is kind of interesting to me to think about you know, who were these people for real? And when I think about historical figures like this who were so embedded into the church, like their whole livelihood depended on the church and the church was such a huge, you know, a huge part of these people's lives, not necessarily even just like religiously, but also financially. Um... It's it's so interesting to me. I find I find this kind of thing very interesting and a lot of people who are not no 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 on top of their music theory by any means, not not their own fault, but like they just don't ever learn about this kind of thing. It's like, "Oh yeah, all that old music is all religious." And it's like, "Well, no, but like the reason why it was printed and the reason why it was like copied copied down like written out by multiple people um, because I believe this is well before, like, printing, but I, I'm not exactly sure. But the reason why this music survived is because of its funding by the church. So, like, there was other music. Obviously, it mentions that, you know, the songs of the streets had invaded its purity and vulgarized the church service. Like, there were other pieces of music being sung in the church and stuff, and that that's super interesting. Um... But yeah, the reason why this other music survived centuries is just because it was written down. I, I'm assuming, you know, <laughs> like you can you can deduce these things. So and of course, it was popular because it was heard, you know, people were performing it regularly and it was for a specific purpose and they were commissioned to write these things and very, very interesting. So that was our minute sketch of the great composers. <laughs> <laughs> of today. So we'll do another one tomorrow and we'll we'll do one every day. It'll be like a little a little advent calendar or something. I don't know. So, yeah, you guys, that's pretty much it for today. I feel very um not like exhausted, but I've been practicing a lot of this Haydn opera that I've been learning and um, also doing a lot of organizing. I feel like January is one of my favorite times to just, like, get my act together. You know what I mean? Like, just getting it all together, putting it in a basket, just putting it, putting everything that I got into a backpack, getting it all organized. <laughs> That's what January's for. So, I did a lot of cleaning today. <coughs> Excuse me. I did... We did a lot of, not a lot, we'll do some more practicing later, but we did a good amount of practicing today, and yeah, I had a little bit of a weird moment right before I actually got back here to 
start recording the podcast, I just felt kind of like stuck in my day. And you know, when you're just kind of like cleaning or you're, you're doing something and the morning gets away from you and you get into the afternoon and you're still doing that thing and you're just kind of like, eh, you know, I'll keep going. I don't necessarily have to go anywhere. I don't really have to do anything today. I'm not on like a time crunch for anything. And you, you kind of just feel like a little bit stuck and you're like, ugh, I could just keep doing what I'm doing, but I also kind of want to do something else. Like that's kind of how I was today. So I did something that I don't normally do, which I've been doing a lot lately, just trying out new things, but I went for a drive and it was nice. I got my oil changed yesterday, so car's running real good. We love it. And I went for a drive. I went down down the road for a while. I didn't really make any turns, so I didn't have to really pay attention to where I was going or I didn't have to put on the GPS or anything. And it was nice. I just kind of cruised and I went out like at the perfect time so I could watch the sunset and it was like golden hour, which is golden hour is like at 3.30 now. <laughs> so we did that and... I had no intentions of going as far as I did, but I went for a while and just kind of listened to the radio, just kind of like erased, shook the Etch-A-Sketch a little bit. And it was very good. And also right now, I'm <laughs> I'm thinking of something that might also help me break up my day, which is looking at my harmonica. And I haven't played her for a couple of days, and I think I'm going to bust her out as soon as I finish with this podcast. I don't think I've told you my my harmonica story. It's not very long, so, I mean, you don't have to buckle up or anything. <laughs> but, like, here it goes. So, my maternal grandparents, their, or my maternal, maternal grand, great-grandmother, she... I guess, knew how to play the harmonica and was pretty good from what everybody was telling me. I don't necessarily, not saying I doubt their credibility, but I don't, I don't necessarily know what good meant, but she had, here, let me just get it. So she had this, um, Honer Chromonica 280 in C and it's in this beautiful like leather or I don't think it's real leather, but this beautiful little case and it's huge for a harmonica. It's just massive and it's a chromatic harmonica. It has four chromatic octaves and yeah, I've just kind of been playing scales on it, just kind of fussing around with, um, you know, like little things here and there, maybe... I actually, I do subscribe to a couple YouTube channels where they give like little beginner lessons and I'm trying to learn how to read like tabs for harmonica, which is interesting because I, I don't know what, how much you know about harmonica, but when I started playing, it was like, I didn't know that you could change the pitch by the inhale or the exhale. And obviously that's really dumb because I think that's like one of the main premises. <laughs> and I didn't know what overblowing is. I don't really even know what that really means right now. I will, I'm sure I'll learn in the future. But yeah, these things, these things are cool. And especially the, the chromatic harmonicas where, you know, you can obviously play in a bunch of different keys because you have that chromatic key. There's one really insane guy on Instagram. I'm going to look him up really quick so that I can tell you about him. But he's insane on the harmonica. And Armon, I don't I'm just like searching harmonica. Ah oh god, yeah, I don't think I'm ever going to find him. But I'll try and remember Oh wait, maybe this is him. Uh, no, I don't think it is. But, <laughs> I don't know. I'll try and find him and maybe talk about him on the next couple podcasts. But, like, the dude is just insane on the harmonica. And I just don't understand 
it's crazy how you can play so quickly. Like his his agility is what really baffles me. He can play these like super super jazzy like funky funky lines dude and just like fly through it on a harmonica and you can see like you know he's going to town on this key so right here there's this button which you can probably hear it totally shifts the holes over and that's what changes it to the chromatic you know notes that's that's what changes it and this guy is, like, going ham, just, like, playing so quickly. And, like, he just knows his scale so well. <laughs> so that's what I'm trying to do. And hopefully after I learn scales and things like that, I will have something to say on the harmonica. Which is why I've been trying to, like, not just play scales. Because I think that's a little bit... It's a little bit obsolete. Like, listen, if you play scales and that's all you play, fine. Don't come for me. I don't even know what I'm talking about. So this is just my opinion. But, like, I like the idea of playing scales and, like, spending an equal time just messing around, either playing with, you know, a blues backing track or someone else playing the blues and, like, you're just kind of, you're, like, ghost, um call and responsing them like maybe they're playing a solo and you're you're kind of adding little things here and there and when I say this I'm so bad at harmonica it's not even funny I'm an extreme beginner I've probably only played it like less than 20 times and you know I I just feel like for me I want to have not only the skills but I also want to have something to say when I start developing those skills, you know what I mean? And yeah, I think that's that's my main goal. And not I'm not trying to say that people who don't do this kind of thing don't have anything to say, but I have known a lot of instrumentalists in my life who value playing scales over like a jam session or they value playing scales over just creating something and and exploring and it's like you know you're playing scales so that you can do the other thing it's not like you're just playing scales so that you can play scales with other people right because that's like not what you're looking to do obviously so it's just frustrating when people get so fixated on I don't want to say technique, but they get fixated on exercises that are, like, written out in a book from, like, a methods book or something, and they don't spend any time, like, having fun or, or, or speaking the language. It's like, it's like just doing a bunch of vocabulary worksheets all the time, which is, like, good. Obviously, you want to, like, learn how to spell and do all those things and like practice writing your letters but like if you're not having conversations with people or like creating your own sentences like writing a letter or something like why are you why are you writing everything a hundred times like why are you practicing what you're doing you know what I mean like what's the point <laughs> anyway um I think I'm gonna cut it off here because I do really want to play this harmonica now and I'm gonna probs turn on some John Mayer, not gonna lie. I do I do really appreciate his his content and what he says in his improvisations, even though you know I'm not very good. <laughs> so we're still gonna do it. And yeah, you guys, that's gonna be it for today. So I hope you enjoyed this little episode, this little abbreviated episode. And I hope you have a wonderful morning, afternoon, evening, or night, whenever you happen to be watching this. Thank you for listening. And I appreciate you. And I, I you know, like, go out and maybe go for a drive. Live your life. Do something that's going to enrich your life a little bit. Read that book that's been collecting dust. You know, put on that record that you've been wanting to listen to, but for some reason your brain tells you not to listen to it. <laughs> like, I don't know. Do that thing. Just go out and do that thing. 
You know what I'm talking about. You know, okay? Don't even try and tell me that you don't because you know. Um, anyway, I gotta go. And I will talk to you all tomorrow. This has been, of course, the Paper Soprano Podcast. I am your host, Heidi, and I never know how to end these episodes. So, thank you so much for listening. (laughs) Okay, love you, mean it. Bye!